Well, good morning. It is good to see you here on this Lord's Day. Welcome to Redeeming Grace Baptist Church. Uh, It's a joy to be together uh, this morning that we might come together to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, together. And I'm glad you're with us. If you're new to Redeeming Grace, we extend a warm welcome to you this morning and just want to say thank you for being with us today. Hope that you are encouraged and edified as we worship uh, our God and Savior this morning. And we're glad you're here, and we would love to connect with you at some point soon. If you're looking for a church, we would love to be able to talk with you further. And so uh, feel free to make use of those opportunities. There's always opportunity right after the service at our guest connection. One of our elders is usually there to be able to to introduce yourself to and us to you. And so we would love to be able to do that if that's uh, something you have time for today. I do want to just mention a few announcements as we uh, begin our time of worship this morning. Uh, The first one is our Lottie Moon Christmas offering, Lottie Moon Christmas offering. This is the offering we do every December, and this this offering goes to support uh, the salaries and ministries of missionaries serving all over the world with the International Mission Board. And so uh, it's a joy to be able to give to this offering. We encourage you to to give generously to the work of international missions. So far, we've uh, received $3,340 towards our $7,500 goal. And so if you can help us meet that goal, that would be fantastic as you pray about giving to support the work of the gospel among the nations. Uh, second uh, thing that we need to be mindful of are the, uh, the, is the church schedule on these coming weeks. So next Sunday, Christmas Day, uh, join us right here for our Christmas morning Uh, service. Uh, It's on a Sunday, obviously, and so we want to gather here to celebrate uh, the gift of God's grace in the person of Jesus Christ next Sunday. And so we encourage you, if you're here in town, 
If you've got family and friends, bring them. Uh, we're going to worship the Lord together next Sunday here at KCA. And then Lord willing, Lord willing uh, and inspection willing, uh, next Sunday we will be, uh, hopefully will be our last Sunday here at KCA. Uh, our plan as of now is to gather for the first service in the new building on January 1st, here in a few weeks, uh, Lord willing. And uh, so we're going to kind of work our way into that building for a few weeks, kind of a soft launch of sorts before our building dedication service, which we've scheduled for January the 15th. And so we're excited about that, looking forward to all of that. Uh, there is some need for moving help over the next few weeks. Uh, there's lots of need for that, actually. And so if you get our church newsletter, you can see some of those needs. If you're available this week or you're available next week uh, in some capacity and want to help, I would just encourage you to email the church office or call us or just reach out to me or Jeremy. That would be most helpful. And we will help line you up with some of the opportunities to uh, get our church office moved, to get things from here at KCA moved. We're starting that hopefully later this week. Uh, there's some installation that needs that are going on that the AV folks are, are working. And so lots of things that we need help with uh, in a very busy season already. And so just um, if you're available, uh, make yourself known <laughs> to us at some point soon. I'm sure we'll be reaching out as well. And then uh, number three, uh, as far as our third announcement this morning, is the Guatemala mission trip. We have a team going to Guatemala May the 18th through the 22nd. Uh, this is a uh, what was termed as a medical missions trip, and so uh, there's need for medical uh, background people to serve in this, in, this, in, in this trip. There's also opportunities for evangelism. So half the team is usually medical. The other half are helping assist in various ways and doing evangelism uh, kinds of ministry. And so if you're interested in being considered for uh, this trip, uh, please see the link in the bulletin. You can also find it in our newsletter and our church website, et cetera, uh, and you can apply for that. And applications need to be in by the end of this month. Um, if you also want to ask further information or ask questions about that and get more information, you can contact Christian Utera. Uh, I think that's all for this morning as far as announcements. There's many things I'm sure that you can be made aware of in the bulletin on our website. Lots going on, uh, but most importantly, we're glad you're here this morning. I want to read from, as we prepare to worship uh, this morning, I want to read from Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 1. This is Mary's song of praise after she had been told by the angel that she would be with child. And this is Mary's response, Luke chapter 1 verse 46. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in their in the thoughts of their hearts, he has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you that we can bow in your presence this morning. And Lord, that our, our souls too could magnify you that we could rejoice in you, God, our Savior, for the way that you have blessed the world, the nations, with the good news of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you that we can gather this morning to celebrate all that you are and all that you've done in your great mercy to redeem sinners from every tribe, tongue, nation, and language. Father, would you help us to make much of you today? Would you meet us here by your Spirit and help us to magnify you, for you are worthy. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, please join us as we sing to Christ our Emmanuel.
you have nothing come he is the offering come see what your god has done christ is born christ is born christ is born for you christ is born christ is born christ is born for be seated and let's pray as God's beloved in your likeness in your image you created us to live in your presence in perfect harmony and flourishing but Adam and Eve sought to break that relationship and sin against you so have we that sin they committed is sin that bears on us even as we enter this world Yet we, with our own offenses, sin against you, our God. You call us to, you command us to be holy and righteous. Yet we are not. We are sin-stained, we are sin-thinkers, and we are sin-doers. God, we confess this. Our broken, sinful ways, we acknowledge it is ultimately you who we have sinned against even as we sin against others in our daily actions. Lord, may this weightiness of sin regularly cause us to reflect on the fact it is your commands we have broken and that your Holy Spirit convict our hearts and move us to repent, turn away from, and flee our sinfulness. And run to you, our Father, to seek forgiveness with a contrite and humble posture. We ask now that you do this even with each person here praying. As each one prays, show us our sin that we might confess and repent and humbly seek you. We desire to be in your presence as you have called us to be, not stirring up your wrath, but being comforted by your mercy. Father, call us out of the darkness day by day. Gird us up in faith to live holy and righteous lives and not be children of darkness. You have given us life and light through your son Jesus, and we are grateful. We pray for all this in Christ's name. Amen. Here from Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Please stand and join us in song again.
Before we pray, I wanted to, I was going to do this during the opening, but um, I wanted more people to be here to hear just a word of thanksgiving to those who've been serving us generously for the past, however long we've been here at KCA, 12 years now? Uh, Many of you have been serving in a variety of different capacities, which has been a huge blessing to this congregation. And we are thankful for any way that any one of you serve this church body. And it's been more to do in a remote or kind of church, we used to call it church in a box, but that's really kind of uh, weird to say out loud. Uh, But here we are kind of in a rented space, and so it takes a lot of work to do this each week. But I just want to say a special word to our setup team, a special word of thanksgiving to you brothers and sisters who have served us so generously for years, month after month after month of coming in here at 7 o'clock in the morning, rolling these carpets out, putting these chairs out with a nice, fine engineering touch, nice straight rows, uh, setting up our sound equipment each and every week uh, that has to be undone after the service, and you get home late for lunch. And so uh, it's been a huge blessing to have you, brothers and sisters, serve us. And so I just want to say thank you. I know that sounds pathetic, right? But, but that's, we, that's, that's what we got. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for serving us so faithfully. I know many of you have uh, grieved over the fact that you're not going to get to do this uh, for very much longer. And so, but I just want to say thank you for serving this church so generously with your time and with your uh, energy. uh, And it's been a blessing to us. We just want to say thank you. Uh, Let's pray. Father, as we, as we continue uh, this service this morning, as we continue our focus on you and thinking through song, singing, expressing through song, uh, these wonderful truths of all that you are and all that you've done, now, Lord, we come to you again in prayer to 
just verbally acknowledge our need of you. Lord, we're mindful, as the scripture was read earlier, uh, in Mary's own response to this great news that she would be with child. Lord, that one phrase just that she spoke uh, there uh, just stands out to me this morning where she said, For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Father, what a glorious reality that you, the mighty, holy creator of the universe, has done great and marvelous things for the glory of your name, but for the good of sinners. Ultimately, Lord, this great work, these great things culminated in our redemption and our salvation, the fact that we could have forgiveness of sins and be reconciled to you, God who is holy and righteous and true. Father, this is the great thing. These are the great things that you've done by sending your own son into this world to live as a man, to die to be raised on the third day and ascending, ascended back into heaven so that sinners could be claimed and adopted as your own. Father, we thank you this morning for this great and glorious gift. We thank you for these great things that you've done for our good and your glory. And so, Lord, because you do great things for your people, because you are a great God and generous in so many ways. We continue to entrust our lives to you and acknowledge our own needs before you. Father, as we do that this morning, we just simply ask for your help. Father, even within this church family, we're mindful of those who are grieving this morning. We pray for the Briggs family. Lord, in the passing of Curtis and Susan's nephew this week, we pray for their comfort and their peace, that you would be near to them during this time, Lord, that you would hold them fast in your care and, and grant them your grace. Father, I acknowledge that there are people, even in this room, who find the holiday season a great challenge. They find it difficult. And so, Lord, would you be near this morning to those who are struggling, those who are in need of comfort, those who are in need of being reminded that you are true and trustworthy, that your promises hold us fast. And, Father, we ask that you would care for their hearts this morning. Father, as we continue this season of Advent and as we think about all that you've done in sending your Son, Lord, we rejoice in that. And Father, we want to be a church that stewards this great news well. And so, Lord, would you help us to continue to be a people who delight in your great work of redemption. Father, as we think about that work that's needed here, we also think about that great work that's needed throughout the world today. We pray, Lord, in light of this focus that we have through the, the month of December on international missions, we pray, Lord, that you would help us to mobilize our resources and contributions in a way that would further advance the gospel to the ends of the earth. Lord, help us to be generous and sacrificial in giving to the work of missions, that we would be able to support joyfully the work of missionaries all across the world today. And Lord, we pray for them. Lord, we have some, almost 4,000 missionaries serving globally today, and most of them will be serving there where they are without being able to be with family during this season. We pray that you would encourage them in their work, that you would draw near to them, and that you would help them and sustain them in what they're doing. Father, as we think about just the upcoming opportunities for us as a church, Lord, we have a lot that's ahead of us with regard to moving into a new facility, and we thank you for the gift of that building, and we thank you for the blessing it will be. But Lord, we do pray this coming week for the upcoming inspections that will be done. We pray that those would go well. We pray that you would guide the, the hands of those continuing to work to, to, to put the finishing touches on the, the building there. 
We pray for the moving logistics that's going to be required and the volunteers, again, that will be serving so diligently to make that happen. Lord, we just ask for your help. Lord, it's a busy season already, and Lord, we just ask that you would help us through this time. Father, we are thankful for all that we've been given in Jesus. We are thankful for your grace. We're thankful for your love. We're thankful for your endless mercies that supply us daily. Lord, help us never to lose sight of your grace, your mercy, your redemption, the hope that we have in Jesus. And Lord, as we continue on in this service, Lord, would you help us to continue to celebrate all that we've been given by your grace and for your glory through the finished work of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. Church family, please stand as we continue singing in worship of our King. invite you to open God's word to the gospel of John this morning as we continue looking through the first 18 verses of this first chapter, John chapter 1. <clears throat> Today our text before us are verses 10 to 13 of John chapter 1, verse 10 to 13. We're going to get a good running go as we come at these verses. We'll start in verse number one, just to continue to catch the um, uh, structure, progression that John is giving to us, i um, like to ask once again, do you stand out of reverence for God's word as we read it? This morning, if you are able, John chapter one, um, let's go and we will read from one to verse number 13. So let's hear the word of the Lord this morning. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, 
and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Will you join me in prayer? Father, we thank you for your word that is light. We thank you for the light in the person and the work of Jesus Christ who has come. Father, we pray now as we open your word that your spirit would accompany it Father, would you help us see marvelous and grand things of you? Lord, would you help us to see reality as it is before us, but it so often does not look to be reality? Lord, would you give us eyes of faith this morning to see Jesus, to see you for who you are, the world for who it is, us for who we are and our need to come to you in faith in the one who came to save us. Father, we thank you for this season in particular where we can come and celebrate your advent, your coming for us. Lord, would that truth ever have an impact in our thoughts, our affections, and our actions. It's in the name of Christ we ask it. Amen. You may be seated. As Pastor Adam stated a couple of sermons ago in John's gospel, these opening verses are so grand and all-inclusive. As we have seen in this series, John jumps right in and he takes us right back to the beginning of creation itself and coming forth with the story and the advent of Jesus. Even to the time before anything was created. It's a hard thing. I'm sure we don't often think about that fact so much or what was going on before anything that we see was ever created. But there was such a time many moons ago when there was nothing. And John sets this cosmic scene to show us the importance of what is taking place in the advent of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So he, he stands back and he sets this scene of what is taking place and who it is that is coming to this earth, who it is that is coming to save and what he is coming to do. And these opening verses speak about that reality, about who we are, what our need is and how Jesus came and the preparatory nature of it and connecting dots from the Old Testament of prophecies made about Jesus and the fulfillment of John the Baptist coming and all these types of things. He sets this grand stage with the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As we look at these verses this morning, we're going to see three truths and movements that we see about Jesus. So three truths and movements that John puts before us that we see about Jesus. The first one that we see is in verse number 10, our first point, Jesus has come. Jesus has come. The beginning of verse number 10 states another amazing truth within these verses as we come to them. Quite simply, John states, he was in the world. He was in the world. The Jesus that John had been speaking of in the previous verses, the Jesus who was the word, 
The Jesus who was with God in the beginning. The one who was very God. With God before anything even was created. The one through whom everything was created. The Jesus who was life. The Jesus who is light. The Jesus who had a prophet come to foretell his ministry, John the Baptist. John was sent from God the Father to prepare the way for Jesus, to point to Jesus, and Jesus, the one who is a true light that enlightens everyone, as verse 9 states, was coming into the world. And here in the first part of verse number 10, we are told this amazing Jesus was in the world. What a glorious, amazing truth that Jesus has come. He has come to this earth. He came to this world. Verse 10 states, he was in the world and the world was made through him. The creator, we could say, has come to his creation. Again, the one prophesied of old, the one whom before anything was ever created, what God had planned to redeem a people for himself Here we see the fact that his feet came to this earth. Through the virgin conception and birth, Jesus was born. He came. That is indeed what we celebrate in particular this time of year. This incarnation that Jesus has come for us. Just consider it today afresh, the one who has created every single thing and just think about the power and the might in that statement and what we know about creation in Genesis chapter one, the one through whom every single thing that we see was created, through whom we are created, that very one has come to his creation. The text this morning points us to this magnanimous truth The creator, Jesus, has come. And brothers and sisters, that very truth, even as we just slowly pause on that this morning and just consider, we say that, right? It's Christmas, we celebrate that Jesus has come and and we might be tempted just to, to move on from that, but just the magnanimous nature of that truth that the creator of the world, our savior in the fullness of time has come to this earth, brothers and sisters, that should lift our spirits. That should give us hope that in the midst of a fallen, sinful world, Jesus came. He came for us. You see, our Savior Jesus is a Savior who comes. He comes for his people. He comes to provide He comes to save. He came to live in obedience. And in the glorious truths of what we have been singing, as we come to him in faith, we can say, Jesus came for me. He came for me to pay for my sin, to deliver me. And what a glorious truth that is, just to pause on and consider this day that our Savior has come to complete the work God has given him to do, he has come for us. Now, if we just stop there for a moment and we didn't read the scripture already, one would think that the world would obviously receive Jesus with open arms. I mean, this is who it is that is coming. One would definitely think the people whom God raised up to bring forth the Savior would welcome him with a red carpet. But that is not what we see happening at all. Quite surprisingly, verse number 10 continues and it says, yet the world did not know him. To know here means more than just understanding intellectual information, like the world did not know him. It doesn't mean like the world didn't meet him or something like, oh, I don't don't know him. I I haven't met him. That's not what is being stated here. It goes further than that. Knowing is a relational idea. Their not knowing was a willful refusal to accept or believe in Jesus. So their not knowing of him was, as we'll continue to see, a rejection 
of him. And that leads us right into the next verse in our second point, that Jesus has been rejected, verse number 11. Jesus has been rejected. Look at it with me. Verse 11 says, he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. John describes for his readers here what happened to Jesus when he came to this earth, specifically when he came to his own people, the Jewish nation. Jesus was rejected. Verse 11 says, he came to his own, meaning somewhat generically his own property. He came to his own domain, the world that he has created. He came to that. And the ESV helps us here in translating the next phrase, and his own people did not receive him. The his own implies Jesus' people, referring specifically here to the Jews, the people of Israel. So not only was Jesus not received by a world made through him, he was also rejected by a people specifically chosen by God as his very own. Even among his own people, Jesus was rejected. The very ones, ironically, who were awaiting and looking for the Messiah rejected the Messiah when he came. Just like what happened so many times in the Old Testament was happening to Jesus. Remember, God sent Israel Jeremiah and they would not listen to him. They would not receive him. We see this repeated theme throughout the Old Testament. God sent Israel Isaiah And they would not listen to him. God's people were, as we saw there, stiff-necked. Isaiah stated the situation he faced in the first chapter of his book. In Isaiah chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, Isaiah said this, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Children have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know, my people do not understand. And in the first 12 chapters of the book of John, we see many accounts of the Jews rejecting Jesus. In fact, John records seven signs that Jesus performed to show that he was the Christ, the Son of God, yet he was rejected, he was not believed. Jesus, the light of the world, the Savior, the Messiah of the Jews has come to the Jews and they rejected him. They didn't believe the signs that he performed. The last of those seven signs was Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And the Jews could not deny what was happening. Instead of believing in Jesus, they wanted to kill the evidence. They wanted to kill Lazarus. They wanted to do away with him. And what we see here as an example is the same thing we know in our own hearts. Once again, we see the powerful effects of sin, the blinding effects of sin to who Jesus is. Because with sin in our lives, we can't see straight. We misconstrue reality. Sin causes us to reject Jesus, to not look to him. This is not just an ethnic Jewish problem in the beginning of this book. This is a humankind problem that we all face. John states in 3.19, the light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. Sin causes us to love darkness rather than the light. That's a problem that we all face through our sinful nature. But just like in Romans chapter 9, when Paul is discussing how the Jews have rejected Jesus, he states in verse 6 of chapter 9, but it's not as though the plans of God has failed. A similar type of pattern is what we see happening here with Jesus. Jesus came to his own. He was rejected by them, but that's not where the story stops. Before moving on to point number three, I just want to state that just because things don't seem right or look right does not mean that God is not at work. The Savior of the world had come to his people and his people rejected him. But guess what? God was still at work. God is a God who works when things look completely out of control. It's true then, it's true now. God is always at work bringing about his plan and God was at work bringing about his plan even when Jesus was rejected. 
brings us to point number three. Jesus has been received, verses 12 to 13. The beginning of verse 12 makes a stark contrast with verse 11. It says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. All did not reject Jesus. In fact, all who believed in him were given the right to become children of God. In approaching these verses, verses 12 to 13, I want to ask just a series of questions to lead us through what these verses are teaching us. First off, we could ask the question, how are we saved? How are we saved? How do we believe, how do we receive Jesus? How is it granted to us the things that are happening in this verse? Well, how are we saved? Well, we see here, John says, but to all who did receive him. We could ask, what does it mean to receive Jesus? What does it mean to receive him? Well, one lexicon defines it like this, to come to believe something and to act in accordance with such a belief. You believe something and you act in accordance with that belief. So to receive Jesus means to acknowledge and believe in who he is that he is divine, the eternal word that has come for us. To receive Jesus is to believe in him. It's not as though Jesus is at a particular place and we go physically receive him. The place that Jesus comes to us is through the preaching of the truth of who he is. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So we receive Jesus by believing in him and the message of God's word given to us about who he is to receive him. And the verse goes on with a parallel statement that further fluffs out what it means to receive Jesus. Verse 12 states, to those who are believing in his name. That's grammatically tied to all who, are, all who receive And believing is in the present tense here. Most of our translations don't bring that out, but it's believing in him. There's a continual nature, a persevering nature to our belief in Jesus Christ. But to all who did receive him, who are believing in his name, that is how we are saved. And this belief is in the object and the person of Jesus. It's in who he is. In the early church, the name of Jesus could simply be called the name. It's just called to believe in the name. And it's speaking about him. And that's such a loaded phrase about who he is, what he came to do, his death on the cross, his obedient life, his resurrection from the grave, the promise of salvation that he gives to all people. That's all tied up in this concept of believing in his Name. It's shorthand, we could say, for the gospel. And that is indeed what we celebrate. That is what we encourage all to believe. So we are saved by receiving Jesus. So if you're here this morning and you're not believing in Jesus as your Savior, maybe that sounds an awkward sort of phrase to you. Why do I need to believe in someone to save me? What do I need saved from? That is exactly what we celebrate here every single Sunday is that Jesus has come and died on the cross for our sins and to take our punishment because the Bible tells us very clearly that we are sinners that we have fallen short of God's law and our just condemnation is death in a real place called hell. But Jesus has come to forgive us of our sins, to take our punishment and to give us everlasting life. That is something that we believe as Christians, not as a once and done thing. That is something we believe every single day. It's something that even in the sharing of it over and over again as we meet together on Sundays, that God's people and as Christians, we say over and over again, yes, that is what I believe. I believe in Jesus. We always come back to the gospel. I believe in what he has done for me. We receive him. Who can be saved? Who can be saved? 
Is salvation only for the Jews? Is it only for the Gentiles? Verse 12 states, but all, all who did receive him, all who did believe in him, Jesus came to be the light of the world, to bring light to all people, both Jew and Gentile. Who can be saved? Well, as the text says, anyone who accepts Jesus, anyone who believes in his name, our gospel message is a true invitation to everyone. Believe in Jesus. Anyone can receive salvation. This is the glorious truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is light to the world. That's the overarching purpose statement of this book of John so that people will hear the gospel message about Jesus and be saved. Again, at the end of the book, John 20, 30 and 31 state this. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. There's only so much papyra. There's only so much ink. There's only so much money to purchase it and time to write it. You can't write the whole thing, but these are written says here, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Everything about him, who he is, that you might have life. You believe in him and you have life. This letter is written to everyone that they may believe in Jesus and have life in his name. That is one of the glorious truths that we focus on at this time of the year, that Jesus brings light and life to all. He is the savior of mankind. That means that there is no one with whom we would not share the gospel with. Jesus has come for all. This is a global message. This means that when you hear the gospel message, your response cannot be, well, he can't save me. You don't know what I've done You don't know the things that I've been through. Well, listen, sin is sin, and Jesus came to die for sinners. Receive him and be saved. It's a global message for all. Another question we could ask is what happens? What happens when that takes place? We're saved by receiving him. Who can be saved? This is for everybody. Well, what happens at the end of verse 12, it states, he gave the right to become children of God. So those who receive Jesus, to those who are believing in his name, Jesus gave the right to become children of God. As we'll see in the next verse, being a child of God doesn't come about through family trees. It comes through faith and it is a change of status for us. We become a child of God. In Jesus, God has given us the right to come into his family, authorization, so to speak. God has authorized it and God is able to make it happen. If God authorizes something, who can come and take away that authorization? Who has authorization to cut out his authorization? When God states it, it is a fact, and he has given us the right to become children of God. As the New Testament will go on to explain, we have been adopted into God's family. Jesus is the only way to the Father, to come into the family. The only way is through him. John speaks about this in John 14. He records the words of Jesus where he states, and you'll know these verses, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The way to the family of God to become his child is through faith in one person and one person alone, one name given among men whereby we are saved and brought into his family, it is through the name of Jesus who has come for us. We are a part of his family. This brings us to the fourth question we see answered, and that is by what means? By what means? Now, verse 11 and verse 12 give give us two different human responses to Jesus, doesn't it? In verse 11, Jesus was not received. In verse 12, Jesus was received. There's human responsibility. Our responsibility is to trust and believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. But lest we only get half the truth, verse 13 gives us the divine sovereignty side of the equation. 
in my mind, I like to think of, think of it as a what's on the surface sort of thing, what we can see, and then work that is done underneath the surface, that is things that we cannot see. On the surface, we see others and hopefully we see ourselves confessing faith in Jesus. We believe in Jesus. I confess Jesus is Lord. I receive him, who he is, what he's done. I believe in him. But then we ask the question underneath the surface, why? Why do people do that? How are people even able in a sinful state to all of a sudden believe in Jesus, to understand who he is and desire to have faith in him? Those are under the surface types of questions and that is what we see being answered in verse number 13, which states there, who were born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh nor of the will of man, but of God. This gives us comment again on those who receive Jesus in verse 12. These verses are gonna get us ready for chapter three that we'll get to at some point in time if the Lord doesn't come back and if we go through the gospel of John. He speaks about there the necessity of the new birth, of being born again. And there are three statements as you heard them as we read through that John negates in this verse about how one does not become a child of God. So three knots for becoming the child of God as he's teaching us. First thing, those who receive Jesus and become children of God did not come by blood. That is by ethnicity. He's speaking here about blood relations. In the new covenant, the children of God are not those who are descendants of Abraham or those who have been circumcised and converted to Judaism. In the new covenant, one does not have to become a Jew to become a child of God. In the new covenant, one is a child of God by faith in Jesus, whether Jew or Gentile. In fact, Christ is the dividing line. Ethnicity is not. It's through the person of Jesus. Grace does not descend, we could say, from parent to child. One is not born into the kingdom of God. As stated in the verses above, it is those who receive and believe in Jesus who are are part of the family of God. So you don't come into the family of God by blood relation, that is by your parents. Just think about that. If you're believing in Jesus here today, it's not because of your parents per se that you are believing in Jesus. Now understand what we're saying in that. Your parents didn't save you is what I'm saying. Yes, they... Lord willing, taught you about Jesus and showed you Jesus, but that's a decision that each of us has to make. We are believing in Jesus because we have believed in him. Nobody else can believe him for us. Second negation is nor of the will of the flesh. We do not become a child of God by the efforts and exhortation of our hearts or our wills. John states later in this book, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Man is simply not able to save himself by his own will. Our wills, as the Bible teaches us, are bent towards evil. And apart from grace, we freely choose to sin, willfully choose to sin. Sin and the effects of the fall have broken our chooser so that we can't choose God by our own will. Another passage so clearly teaches this truth that John is stating, and that is Romans 9, 16. There Paul is talking about how God has mercy on some and not on others, and how God's mercy is just that, the bestowing of something on someone who doesn't deserve it. And speaking about saving faith and receiving mercy, Paul states there, Romans 9, 16, so then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. It's not human desire, will, or effort that brings us into the family of God. We cannot will our way in. The third negation is nor of the will of man. We also can't be born into the family of God by the desires or actions of someone else. It's not the will of man that brings us into the family of God. Just think about it. If you had children or if your parents have children, which I'm saying that'd be about 100% of us, 
We desire for our children to become children of God. But at the end of the day, we can't make that happen. You can't make that happen. You can't make your kids or your grandkids become a child of God. We don't get into the family of God because someone else wants us there. We can't put others there, not only the fact with children, but anybody else for that matter, right? We can't, it's not our will that can put them there. We just pause for a minute and say, isn't that why we pray? When we pray for salvation, who do we pray to? We pray to God to bring salvation because God is the giver of life. And so we pray to God, God, be at work in this person's life. Help them see their sin. Give them life so that they may receive Jesus and believe in him. Man cannot confer grace upon someone else. Grace is not dispensed like candy to those whom the church wants to give it to. Those who are the children of God are born, as the text says, of the will of God. That is how we become a child of God. We are born, as verse 13 says, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but that is we are born of the will of God. Those who are children of God are born because of the will of God. God is the cause. We are born by the will of God. We become children of God by God willing that. Only God can give us salvation and the new birth. We choose to believe in God because he chose to save us. To put it another way, we love him because he first loved us. Why does one believe in Christ? It's because God is at work in their lives calling them to himself. We are saved by grace and that means not by anything in us. What a glorious, glorious truth. What a glorious, glorious fact about the person and the work of Jesus Christ and what he came to do. As we say, he did for us what we could not do for ourselves. Is why salvation is of mercy, it's of grace. The celebration becomes all the more sweeter, doesn't it, when we praise God for what he's done in giving us life because there's no other way to receive it. We can't get life on our own. God is the one who has brought forth Jesus to give us life and light. Even at the beginning of this great book, John goes to a lot of trouble to spell this truth out in verses 12 and verse 13. Again, he's going to go on further, and that's kind of how introductions and prologues work. There's a lot of condensed things in these opening verses that are going to be expanded on throughout the rest of the gospel of John. We'll see that in John chapter 3, where Nicodemus comes saying you must be born again and what that means and how we are born again. But clear for us to see here is by what means we are brought into the family of God and it is by the grace of God himself. This Jesus who gives us grace, who brings us salvation, has come to this world. The one who is with the Father begotten, not created, the one who was present in creation, he has come to this earth to bring light and life. Let us celebrate that truth and that reality this week. Lord, keep us from being distracted from that. It's... It seems so crazy that a season that is meant to point us to celebrate Jesus is a, is a season that becomes such a distraction to helping us point to Jesus and celebrate Jesus. The things that we hear this morning from the Gospel of John, you're, you're not going to necessarily hear those things just on your typical normal Christmas songs. The hustle and the bustle are not going to point you to these truths and these realities. 
And so this week, let us be a people who's not just swept away by not receiving and not praising God for the reality and the truth that Jesus has come for us. Brothers and sisters, that's a mental thing for us to do, to mentally focus on Christ and who he is, to worship him for what he has done and what he brings into this world. Simply ask you today, what is your response to him? What is your response to this one that has come? Will you receive him? Will you receive him? Will you believe in him? Will you continue to believe in him, to trust in him? He is able to save. He is able to give life. God is able and has authority to make us his children. May we receive him this day and believe in him every day until he calls us home. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the gift of Jesus. Father, we thank you for your word that points us to this reality and this truth. The reality that all who receive Jesus, who believe in his name, you bring into the family of God and make a child of God. Father, what you have done for us is what we could not do for ourselves. Lord, do you help us to trust and believe in you? Help us to rejoice in what you've done for us. And even now as we come with this closing hymn to sing, to celebrate your blood that causes us to be your child, Lord, would you strengthen our hope and our faith in you and help us, Father, to take this message to a world of darkness. In the name of Jesus, we ask it. Amen. Please join us and stand. Sinners blind
Amen, indeed. You know, as we celebrate this Advent season, that word Advent comes from a Latin word which means coming. I always laugh when I see an Advent calendar that has nothing to do with Jesus. It's not Advent. Advent has everything to do with the coming of Christ into the world. As Jeremy preached, Jesus has come. And the truth is that some reject him and some receive him. And friend, if you're here this morning and you have never received Jesus, maybe you don't think of yourself as having rejected him, But friend, if you've not received him in faith, you have rejected him. And so we would urge you this morning that you would hear this message about Jesus, the fact that he's come into the world, his advent means our salvation, that you would receive him by faith, receive him as a gift. We're going to receive gifts this Christmas, most likely, some of us. Think about those gifts a year from now. You'll have forgotten about it. Most of us will have outgrown some of those gifts. The technology will be new a year from now, and we'll need updated. But friends, this gift that we have in Jesus Christ, we will never outgrow it. It will never need to be updated because he is the savior of the world, and he has accomplished our redemption. So friend, trust in him. Believe in him, receive him, because he came for people just like you. And if you need to know more of what that means, if you need someone to talk about that with today, we're here. We would love nothing more than to talk with you about what it means to receive, to believe in, and to follow Jesus Christ, because he is our only hope. So friends, receive this word of benediction from 1 John chapter 5. Verse 20, as we depart, John wrote, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Let's go with that hope. In that message, you're dismissed. Between where I used to be and this reckoning.